Hello and welcome to another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, it's the Las Vegas Summer League opener for the Timberwolves today. We'll talk about what to watch for, what to expect from Josh Minot, from uh, Leonard Miller, and also from the rookies this year, and Jalen Clark, who we've never seen play. What to expect, what to look for from each of those guys. Plus, the Timberwolves felt, filled their final two-way contract spot, and uh, we'll talk about that today as well. Welcome in. You are Lockdown Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beek and I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend. Happy Las Vegas Summer League opener. Like, hey, it's only been like five weeks since the Timberwolves, six weeks since the Timberwolves played last. And this isn't the real Timberwolves, but it's still Timberwolves basketball. There's still going to be people on TV playing basketball, wearing Minnesota Timberwolves jerseys, kind of sort of practice jerseys, whatever. Still, a big day. Summer League kicks off. We're going to talk about that today, among other things. A big thank you off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms, no matter where you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right. Let's cover some of the, uh, I don't want to say minor news, but I guess more relevant Timberwolves news here off the top. Uh, Anthony Edwards competed in the Team USA scrimmage on. Was it Wednesday night? I think it was actually Wednesday night that he was in the scrimmage and uh, played really well. One of the best players on the floor, certainly. I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see how much run he gets. He's still coming off the bench. Of course, a nod to uh, even in a lineup that started three guards. I mean, the, the Team USA started Drew Holiday, Steph Curry, and Devin Booker with LeBron James and Joel Embiid. Now, uh, Embiid fouled out in 12 minutes in this game, and this was a, uh, you know, a, a, a scrimmage um, against a good a good opponent. Team Canada is going to be really good this year. We talked about that the other day because Nick Alexander Walker is on the team. Uh, but I, like, curious to see how much Ant plays. Remember last summer when he played for Team USA, that was of course the uh, it, it was the World Cup team. It wasn't the Olympic team. It wasn't exactly the same caliber of player. And of course, Ant was coming off the bench to start that as well. Now things have changed over the last eleven months related to Ant standing in the NBA. So. Uh, curious to see what that looks like. I'm not saying for sure he's going to start moving forward, but that could change. He ended up playing 19 minutes in the game and he scored, uh, I think 13 points. Yeah. 13 points in the game, five of eight on twos, one of two on threes, three boards and assist a steal, a couple turnovers. He hit the buzzer beater before halftime. So good game for Ant. with all the, the talent on this team. I mean, like also off the bench, you have Jason Tatum, you have Terry's Halberton. Like this is a, Obviously, it's an Olympic team. It's an incredible team. You're going to have Kevin Durant playing minutes once things kick off here uh, eventually in the Olympics. So a stacked team, to be sure, um, even without the exit of Kawhi Leonard, of course. Uh, but interesting to see how much run Ant gets and uh, what that looks like as they get close to the Olympics. I don't have any hot takes on that other than uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch Anthony Edwards be part of this caliber of team for Team USA. Uh, also, Dacia Nix. Signs a two-way deal with the Timberwolves. The Timberwolves now have filled all three two-way contract spots. They are full other than their final standard roster spot, which they're very likely to leave open. And the P.J. Dozier contract reported a little over a week ago was reportedly partially guaranteed. So in theory, they could still add someone else and then ultimately waive Dozier or I guess anybody else. But Dozier would be the most likely since he's the only partially guaranteed contract for this season. Everybody else on the roster has been reported as, or I believe is a full based on uh, all the reporting that's out there and, and the numbers that are out there, everybody has a fully guaranteed deal except PJ Dozier. So if they really felt necessary to add a 15th or yeah, 15th player, they could. And then if they wanted the roster spot still, they could waive Dozier later. They bought themselves a little bit of flexibility there, but now the two way slots are full too. They've, they have Jalen Clark on year two of a two year, two way deal. They signed Jesse Edwards, who we talked about a couple different times this week, the center who played at West Virginia last year after four years at Syracuse. Uh, big, big uh, rim running roll big. He's he's on a two-way deal as an undrafted rookie who's going to be 25 soon. And then Dacia Nix is back as a two-way player. And the Knicks thing is interesting to me, and I've been critical 
critical is a strong word. Uh, I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm pretty neutral on Dacia Nix. Like clearly there were some bench vibes going on there and I'm sure that plays into him coming back and he brings a sort of attitude and uh, edge isn't the right word. He's not on the floor enough to like truly bring an edge to the opponent, but clearly there's some, there's some bench vibes, some locker room vibes there with Dacia Nix. And I mean, like even, even in the G league last year, when he played, he was an inefficient score. Like my cliff notes on him last year, when they initially signed him to an exhibit 10 deal and brought him to training camp was he was one of my least favorite guys they brought to training camp because that's what he is. He's a, he's a big body, high usage, low efficiency guard. And well, the Timberwolves and Tim Connolly certainly love their big guards. I just wasn't sure what he was bringing to the table other than high volume, inefficient scoring. And that's kind of what he did in the G league last year too. I mean, he played 13 total G league games. He averaged 22, six and six, which is great, but he shot under 40% for the field and 24% from outside the arc. He's only 64% on free throws last year in the G League. So I think he's a better shooter than that. And in limited NBA action, he's been a little bit of a better shooter than that. But you go back and look what he did in two years with Houston at the NBA level, certainly a younger player, kind of the same deal. So there's a little bit of upside there still, but it's really more of a vibes two-way signing. There isn't much at risk there for Minnesota. And, you know, enough other guys have left. I'm sure that that plays into it too, some familiarity there. And that's kind of the luxury of having this third two A spot. You can have him there on the bench and it gives you an emergency backup point guard. Of course, the Wolves only have two point guards on the roster with Mike Conley and Rob Dillingham. That's it. They didn't sign a third point guard. They didn't bring back McLaughlin. They didn't bring back Monte Morris. And their quote unquote third point guards are some combination of Anthony Edwards and Nikhil Alexander Walker and Joe Ingles. Like those are the guys who are going to initiate the offense if Dillingham's not on the floor or if they want Dillingham to play off the ball a little bit more. So it makes sense to sign Knicks. Remember, last season, the Timberwolves entered the season with only two point guards on their roster, and Dacia Nix only played rotation minutes in one game, and that was that game in Utah when they had like eight guys, that, or maybe nine guys that suited up because of the Gobert got hurt, Cat was out. It was like in late March, I think it was, and Dacia Nix was fine in like, I don't know, eight to ten rotation minutes, but regardless of whatever else happened, even when Conley was resting, like Dacia Nix wasn't suiting up and playing for this team last year. Maybe that changes this year. But it's so much more of a depth and vibes signing than anything else. I don't, I just don't know that there's a whole lot of upside there other than he's going to give you some volume scoring. And I do think he's a better shooter than the 24% he shot in the G League last year. It's only 16 games. It's a or 13 games. It's a relatively small sample. Um, I think he's a good enough shooter. And again, big guard, big body. He could do some things. So I'm totally fine with him signing him. It does kind of limit like now there's in my mind, and I could be completely off base here, but I think having the open two way was kind of an extra incentive in summer league to get the very best out of guys. Now at the same time, if you're not getting the best out of guys that are trying to, for their NBA, for their pro basketball lives to, to get a spot when summer league, then maybe probably you don't want them anyway, if they're not going to play hard, but just kind of have that carrot, like, Hey, this, this two way spot could be open. I mean, remember that's how Nas Reed was first signed was to a two way. That's how Jordan McLaughlin was first signed both out of summer league. The Wolves then converted the Nasri two-way into a uh, a partially guaranteed, essentially a second rounders type contract that same summer. McLaughlin, it took him a season to get there, but that's how he got in with the team as well. Was a strong showing in summer league. So, I you know, I think there could have been some benefit to leaving it open. And we talked a lot about Nadir Hefe the other day. Um, I like realistically, he's probably too raw to be at the NBA level. And I actually think there's some similarities. I think higher upside version of Dacia Nix. Frankly, I think he's a better shooter probably. Um, but if you're a conference finals team, are you really looking for super high upside with your final two-way spot? Or are you looking for depth pieces and locker room pieces? And that's exactly what Dacia Nix should be. All right. Next, I want to get into summer league. We'll spend the rest of the time today on exactly that. We'll talk about what to expect, what to look for, from each of the Timberwolves, I'm going to focus specifically on the players that are on standard NBA contracts with the Wolves. We'll go through all five of those guys, what to look for from them uh, coming up here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, 
your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Do you watch Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day long? If so, no doubt you have to turn down the volume because of all the shouting. Instead, make the switch to Lockdown Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Lockdown Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so the tip rolls going into Summer League. They have five guys that will be playing, actually now six if you include Dacia Nix, that I would consider standard roster guys. Two of them are rookies. Actually, technically three of them with Jalen Clark. Uh, one was a draft pick last year. One was a draft pick two years ago. And then you also have the actually two two-way guys. So Jesse Edwards and, um, well, Jalen Clark's a two-way guy too. So all three two-way guys. But Jalen Clark is also somebody who I would include as a regular roster guy because he was on the team last year. And then you have Jesse Edwards and Dacia Nix. But I want to focus on those five guys. Rob Dillingham, Terrence Shannon Jr., Leonard Miller, Josh Minot, and Jalen Clark. What to look for from those guys? What are the Timberwolves looking for? What should we be looking for as we're watching Summer League? Let's start with the headliner. That's Rob Dillingham. I, I actually don't know how much to take out of Summer League with Rob Dillingham because all the things he's already really good at, he sh like that fits in with how Summer League works. He's going to be good in transition. He's going to be good scoring the basketball. He's efficient. And, and the question marks are almost entirely on defense. It's weird. Like, I'm that comfortable with his offensive game, and he's that good offensively. We talked about this with Tyler Metcalf of No Ceilings NBA a couple weeks ago. If he was two, three inches taller, he's almost surely a top three pick, if not the top pick in the draft this year. Uh, the concerns are related to his defense and his size. The size probably will not matter in, this summer, in the Las Vegas Summer League, at least not significantly. The defense I'm most curious about, but... It's going to be really hard to tell in the summer league opener or over the course of four to six summer league games what that defense is going to look like. Yeah, he'll probably play against some better athletes and some better backcourt guys uh, than he saw in the SEC. Probably more athleticism, maybe some more experience, depending on who they play. Uh, I haven't looked at the rosters of the opponents yet for summer league. Um, it's always kind of a fun surprise when you're watching the Timberwolves in summer league. You're like, oh, that guy's on that team. And then you look up the roster and it's like three guys you remember from multiple summer leagues past or from playing small college basketball or March Madness or whatever. Uh, anyway, the defense is obviously the big question with Dillingham, but we're not going to learn a whole lot from summer league. I, I'm looking mostly for feel and command, which are things that he was very good at at Kentucky, but the vibe changes a little from not a little, a lot, even from the sec changes from college to the NBA. It, it, the the vibe in terms of running a team changes that much. So it well, I, and, and at the same time, I would argue that the that the actual shooting and scoring ability, well, complicated, is um, not complicated. Well, it's, it'll be more challenging at the NBA level. He's a good shooter. He's going to be able to shoot the ball at the NBA level. He's crafty enough and to get his shot off. He's got good enough touch to get his shot off. Um, so I, I don't really worry about that. Um, and that's not, that's not what I'm looking for because again, I think he's going to score the basketball. What I would watch is how he runs the team. Again, not the same thing in summer league, but it'd be a good, a good indicator if he's able to kind of command the floor, call plays, know when to slow it down or push the pace in transition and just look really comfortable in all situations. It's the command. It's the feel. It's things that I'm confident he'll be good at at the NBA level, but I just want to see it. I want to see it at the next step, which is often disorganized, kind of helter skelter, yet competitive and 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 you know difficult summer league play. Can he look calm, cool, collected, and in charge in what's going to be a again helter skelter kind of hectic environment? That's what I'm most curious to see with Dillingham. He's going to score. He's going to score relatively efficiently. I think. Defense, I'm not going to come out of this saying, man, he can defend in the NBA or or he has no shot. 
summer league won't do that for me but i will feel better or worse about how he commands the team as as the floor general as a point guard that's what i'm watching for dillingham uh josh minot he's the player that i'm most excited to watch because i think he's got the biggest swing of man this guy hasn't learned anything or he could be the 10th man this year and has a shot to play real rotation minutes. The the biggest thing for Minot, I actually think it's hard to tell in terms of feel. I actually think he's shown, he's played really well in summer league the past, especially last year. He had at least one 20 plus point game last season. He was getting the post game interview on ESPN. Like I actually think Minot looked the part last year in summer league. And I had some hope he would get some minutes last season during the, during the season. It, it didn't end up playing out that way. But if he continues to show feel as a cutter, as and it's weird because in summer league, his role is not the same as it's going to be if he gets on the floor with Anthony Edwards and Mike Conley and Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert this year. And that's what I always thought was a little bit weird, like McDaniels three years ago. They wanted to see him, you know, on the ball more, do more stuff, put the and like it was good for his growth and development. And, and obviously this will be for Josh Minot, but they're gonna want him to be more aggressive offensively in summer league than he ever would be in the regular season for the Timberwolves. If he's ever on the floor as part of the rotation in the regular season for the Minnesota Timberwolves, he's the fifth option, maybe the fourth option at best. But he needs to show when he gets a catch and shoot three-point opportunity, can he knock those down? Can he make the right choice to pump fake and drive to the basket? Can he finish through traffic and in transition through contact? Can he get to the line and make free throws? Is he active enough as a cutter off the ball when he is off the ball? Again, he'll get have the ball in his hands more in Vegas than he will in the regular season. But if he excels in all these different areas, he's going to make his his case. The big question for Minot is always the shot. In, in his career in the G League, over the course of the last two seasons, showcase cup plus regular season play, he's like, I think he was 34 for 101 from three. So a shade under 33% or right about 33% from three-point range. That's well below league average at this point in the NBA. In limited, limited, limited action, mostly garbage time at the NBA level, he's, he's a little better than that. But... He needs to show that he can shoot somewhere close to league average. Now, McDaniel struggled to shoot that well last year, but we also know the year prior he was about 40%. So, uh, you know, the, the the runway, or I guess the at this point, the opportunity for Minot has been limited. And this is still a limited opportunity. It might only be four games of summer league play. But he needs to show that growth. Is he comfortable and confident shooting open threes? No one's asking him to shoot it off the dribble like Anthony Edwards. No one's asking him to handle the ball in the open floor much. Although that's the other thing I'm going to look for is, can he handle the basketball? Again, he's not going to have to do that very often in the NBA if he if he's the 10th man this year. He's going to be out there for energy, for defense, for offensive rebounding, for blocking shots, help defense. But if he gets the ball in the half court, can he pump faking and get to the basket without dribbling the ball off his foot? Can he make the right pass? swinging the ball in the perimeter to the open guy in the corner, the decision-making some of those skills that are going to be vital. If he is a rotation piece, he needs to show those in Las Vegas. And I go back to what I talked about last summer with him in college. He had a steal rate that would have been the best in the NBA. His block rate would have been a top 10 block rate in the NBA. If you look at what he did in college and in G league, those numbers aren't quite to that level. The block rate's actually close. The steal rate isn't, but it's it'd still be really good. Like his steal rate in the G League would have ranked very highly on the Timberwolves last year. So the nose for the ball, the 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 stocks he'll he'll get, the activity level, uh, the do stuff ability, as I like to call it. It's been a while since I've said that, probably since I talked about mine out last summer. Um, the those are the things that Timberwolves need out of a ninth, tenth, eleventh guy on the roster. And he's gonna be that regardless. But is he gonna get minutes over Terrence Shannon Jr., over Josh, or excuse me, over uh, Leonard Miller? It's kind of those three guys vying for that 10th spot in the rotation. And there are 10 guys that play most nights, especially early in the season. Go back and look for Denver last year and all the guys that were playing in November, Julian Strother and, and um, Zeke Naji and guys that were not playing in April and May. But if these guys play, if Minot plays well in summer league and he plays well in training camp and he plays well in preseason, he gets a spot in the rotation when the season starts and then plays well then, then he becomes kind of a staple of the rotation. Like, he's got a real shot at that. And I still think he's got that Brandon Clark-esque upside as a like a, a do-everything four that can guard some threes, that can rebound like a five. Uh, all of the above is, is there for Josh Minot. He's got to show some growth there, and especially 
in addition to the feel, he's got to knock down some threes in, in summer league and look comfortable and confident doing it. He's got to maintain that level of activity though on the glass and defensively though, too. That's also going to be really important. All right. We still have to talk about Leonard Miller. We got to talk about Jalen Clark. We got to talk about uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. Three guys to cover here. What to look for from them. What's most important for them in summer league. We'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Locked Eye Wolves is brought to us by BetterHelp, the show sponsored by BetterHelp. Comparison is the thief of joy, and it's easy to, uh, to envy other people's lives. It may look like they have it all together on Instagram or whatever your social media platform of choice is, although Instagram certainly feels like it brings out the uh, best slash worst in people in, in regard to comparisons. In reality, they probably don't. It's a highlight reel. Right. If you're looking at people on social media, comparing that to your life, you're looking at their highlight reel and, and, you know, you you see everything about yourself. And that could put us all in a tough spot because comparison really is and can be the thief of joy. Social media can be a dark place at times, but therapy can help you focus on what you want instead of what other people might have. And they may not even have it. It may just be social media telling you they do and they don't. Therapy can help you focus on what you want. So you can start living your best life. If you're thinking about starting therapy, consider giving BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you got to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Locked on NBA. All right. Uh, let's talk about the three players we have to get to here still. Let's go with Leonard Miller because he's the other guy that was on the roster and, and played, albeit sparingly, last year. Leonard Miller has all the tools, and he was very impressive last year in the G League and, and showed, and of course, he spent the year prior in the G League Ignite. Remember, he didn't play college ball. He's from Canada. He played G League Ignite, was drafted in the second round by the Wolves was thought by many to potentially be a first-round talent. And last year, improved all of his numbers. Uh, the overall efficiency was down, but he shot more threes and shot them better. He just didn't shoot as well from two-point range last year in the G League as he did the year prior with the Ignite. Um, but improved his scoring averages, shot 38% in regular season play and 33% from three in the Showcase Cup, and did a little bit of everything. And the appeal with Leonard Miller is he's got the size of a center, at least the the length and the height of a center, but he's got the skill set of a of a point forward of a guard, really. And he can do really everything. There's there's no real question other like the only real questions about him as a prospect are consistency. That's number one, and it's on both ends of the floor. Can he consistently do what everybody knows he's capable of doing? And that's that's one of the biggest problems for any prospect, right? But he literally has all the skills. And then the only other thing would really be building out his body, making sure the frame uh, is is strong enough to absorb NBA level contact consistently. Now he's been playing professionally for two seasons. It's a it's a much smaller number of games. He's played what uh, he played twenty two games total last year, and like thirty six the year before. So if he's ever going to be a rotation level player at the NBA a rotation player at the NBA level is going to play a lot more. So building his body out is going to matter significantly when it comes to that. Um, and there's some, you know, rumblings maturity wise too. Uh, there's some questions about maturity level and that goes along with the consistency. Some things that I've heard related to, you know, uh, behind the scenes and some stuff like, is he going to consistently uh, show up every day, put the effort forward, take it all seriously. And, um, and, and, you know, do do all of the above plus the basketball side because the tools are all there. So I'm very curious to see if if he shows up. I don't want to say in terms of summer league. Well, I guess, yeah, taking it seriously like that matters. Like even though he didn't play anything but garbage minutes at the NBA level, garbage time minutes, I should say, uh, he's still coming into this as an NBA player. Like he played in the NBA last year as a draft pick. He's an NBA contract. He could approach it as a too cool for school type situation. Will he be taken seriously? Will he also be composed and not trying to do too much? We saw that at times last year in summer league, which is understandable from a rookie. I don't want to take anything. Uh, I, I don't want to be too harsh on him, but he's got to show that he's ready to put it all together. And he's got a shot at that 10th man role too. I think he's probably the least likely of the three of Minot, Terrence Shannon Jr. And Miller. I think Miller's the least likely of the three to see actual rotation minutes just because he doesn't like Minot has a, a very clear skill set and path. Terrence Shannon has a very skill set clear skill set and path. 
and we'll talk more about him in a minute. Leonard Miller is kind of a jack of all trades. I don't want to say he's a master of none because he's pretty good at, at most of them, but you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. And Terrence Shannon's a rookie, but he's he played five years in college, and I think we know mostly what we're going to get out of him or like what his floor is. Same thing with Josh Minot. He's been in the league two years. He was very raw coming in, but you know he's going to give you energy, defense, rebounding, and not a whole lot offensively. Leonard Miller can do all everything. All the things we're talking about or, or aren't talking about, he can do it. But what's the like? The floor is maybe lower than the other guys. We don't know exactly what that'll look like at the NBA level because he hasn't been given the chance. He's got to prove it in practice in summer league, in preseason, in training camp before the Timberwolves give him a legit shot. So this is one of those checkpoints for Leonard Miller. Can he be composed? Can he take it seriously? Can he do all of the things he can do consistently over the course of a very, admittedly, very short, you know, week to 10 day window in, in Las Vegas. All right. Uh, Jalen Clark it, put simply like, how is he going to move? He hasn't played basketball in a year and four months. He tore his Achilles in, I think March or, or late February of 2023 at UCLA could have been a lottery pick was the best point of attack defender in the NCAA that season. And he has it like he played in, he practiced with the G league with the Iowa wolves very late in the season, like right at the end of their season. And he was cleared for full game contact of about a week ago. So what's he going to look like when he gets on the floor in real game action? How does he move? And the bigger question from longer term, and I don't want to overreact because he hasn't played in so long, but what will he be able to do offensively? He was not a good offensive player in college. Can he develop as either somebody who can initiate some offense and get into the paint a little bit, or can he develop a jumper, which he did not have at UCLA? So we'll spend more time on that. I think we'll know a lot after we see him play this weekend. Um, so, but, but put simply, what does he look like after so much time off? How does he knock the rust off? I'm not going to come out of summer league saying, I'm not going to overreact either way with him. Although if he looks great off on both ends of the floor, I may a little bit. I'm not going to overreact if he doesn't because the dude hasn't played in almost a year and a half. Uh, lastly, Terrence Shannon Jr. I spent a lot of the show on Thursday on Terrence Shannon Jr. Uh, talked to Sonny Verma of Lockdown Illini about his two seasons at Illinois, what he improved on. And I've talked a lot about him in the last couple of weeks. He's going to be really good in summer league because he's a high volume score, high volume three point shooter a terror in transition. I keep using that phrase, but it's absolutely true. He's going to dunk on guys. He's going to knock down threes in transition. He's going to get in ones. Although he does need to finish at the rim. The actual at the rim percentage wasn't outstanding last year at Illinois. And he did get to the line a bunch. Um, so like I didn't watch enough full games of him to know it was, he simply trying to draw contact that didn't come. So he's throwing up circus shots or is he struggling to finish their contact. We're going to find out pretty quickly. Summer league can be pretty handsy, pretty physical. These guys are all battling for their, professional basketball lives. And, uh, but I think for the most part, this is kind of tailor made for a dude like Terrence Shannon Jr. Who's big, physical, athletic, loves to shoot the three, loves to get out in transition, loves to jump passing lanes and get steals. He's going to look good. I'm not going to react too much either direction with Terrence Shannon Jr. Either, unless he just looks absolutely awful. Uh, but this should be kind of in his wheelhouse in terms of his skill set at the, at, well, not just at the NBA level, at any level, this is, this is, what he does is play fast and wreak havoc on both ends of the floor, score in bunches, uh, you know, get pick sixes. Like that's what he's going to do in summer league. It should be a lot of fun to watch. So I'm looking forward to watching him. And then of course the two, two way guys, Jesse Edwards, the big, the center played last year at West Virginia, four years at Syracuse. And uh, we talked about Dish and Nicks earlier, those guys on the roster as well. So uh, the Timberwolves play today. They play Friday at 4 PM. That game is on, I believe it's on NBA TV. I'm trying to pull up the schedule here. Oh, uh, no, sorry. ESPN 2, 4 p.m. Central, ESPN 2 on Friday. Then they play Sunday afternoon at 4.30 on NBA TV. So on Monday's show, we'll talk about my reaction and takeaways from Wolves Pelicans Summer League Friday, Wolves Pacers Summer League Sunday. That'll be Monday's show, kind of not recapping, but key takeaways from a two-game sample. And then... uh they play again Tuesday night and Thursday night next week. So we'll talk next week about what the overall schedule is, but primarily going to be focused on summer league over the next week or so week plus. Um, and of course the format is after the four games, the top four teams play in the semifinals. They each play. There's two semifinal games and the winners play it in championship. So the max number of games they could play is six. The minimum is four uh, point differential, et cetera, plays into and head to head record plays into whether or not they advance into the semis, which would be a week from Sunday. All right, that's all we got for you today. We'll be back on Monday. We'll talk about 
the first two summer league games on Monday's show. Big thank you for making Locked on Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Locked on Wolves. You can also watch the Locked on Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon at Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Locked on T-Wolves and also at B Beacon with two Bs, two E's, C K. Ian, a reminder that Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. It's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Lockdown Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts in all the biggest stories. Of course, we're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked on Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.